Greetings to all of you, near and far, from First Lutheran Church in Windsor, Ontario. When we learn something in church, that's always good. But to learn something, we need the right people and the proper occasion and the right circumstances. And that's going to be difficult on this, the ninth Sunday after Trinity. Because Jesus tells us a story about a scallywag, about somebody who doesn't take justice very seriously and is not very honest in his dealings. And yet Jesus says, learn from him. We're going to talk about him and what that is all about in the sermon. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. 
Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions, make them to ask such things as shall please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The epistle appointed for this Sunday is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter, it is today the basis for the sermon. Jesus also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. From the Holy Gospel on this Sunday in Luke chapter 16, let me again quote these words. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. My friends, I must admit it, and I'm not quite sure whether I dare to say it in all honesty, this is a scandalous story. And I know of many of my colleagues, pastors and theologians who have their real doubts about this quotation from the Gospel of Luke in chapter 16. It's generally referred to as the parable of the dishonest manager. And yet Jesus, we are told, commends him for what he had done. Not in the sense that he says, you can learn how to beat the system. You can kind of go around the laws of decency and honesty. But rather, we have to listen carefully what the point of this parable is that Jesus tells. But first of all, yes, I said it at the beginning, it seems such a scandalous story. Jesus talks about a man who does not take honesty and justice very seriously, who gets around the rules of decent behavior, and yet at the same time Jesus says, learn from him, and we'll have to ask in the course of the sermon about what are we to learn from him, from a person that is called a dishonest manager? Well, the story talks about the interaction between the Lord and his servant. And we have to remember it's a story that Jesus tells, not just anybody. It's not just a piece of literature that we should say, oh, how terrible, and never act like that. Because, as I say, Jesus commends him for what he did, especially for the reason that he did it. He is acting in behalf of his own master. In those days, a manager, a steward, was fully in charge of the property that the master had entrusted to him, and that the decisions that the manager made were binding the master in all the legal aspects that one can think of. And here you have a man who has been accused of dishonesty. People have kind of gotten to know what shady dealings this man apparently was account, uh, accounted of. And they went and told the master about it, and the master's reaction is, turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And so one of the f things that we learn from this story is there will be a final accounting. I know that some people don't like to hear that. They think that we're trying to scare people into a certain kind of attitude or a certain kind of behavior. But God has very clearly in Holy Scripture told us that in the end we will all appear before the judgment seat of God. So there will be a final account. And God says, turn in the account of the management of all the things with which I have blessed you in this life. There are many things that God has given to you, that he has entrusted to your care, with which he has blessed your life, made it possible. And yet, of all the things that God has given to you, that he entrusted to you, he's asking, show me. Tell me how you dealt with that. What did you do with it? In the Lutheran Catechism, 
We have learned when we, for instance, pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. And then Martin Luther says, now what do we mean by daily bread? Certainly not only the slices that we eat at breakfast in the morning, but we are told daily bread includes everything that has to do with the support and needs of the body. Imagine that. All the things that God has entrusted to and he enumerates them, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, a devout husband or wife, devout children, devout workers, devout and faithful rulers, imagine that in our country. Good government, good weather, peace, help, self-control, good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like. And I don't think Luther meant to imply that that is the end of the list. That's how gracious God has been. And we have to ask ourselves, how have we dealt with all the things that God has commended to our care, that he has entrusted to us Remember, already at the beginning of creation, he said to Adam and Eve that, he, that they are given all these things to till it and to keep it. And in the end, God will require a final accounting. And obviously, if you're like me, like many people, we must honestly admit that we have not been as faithful either as we should have been or as we could have been. That we have sometimes not used the many things that God has given to us in the way that serves the glory of God and our fellow man. And so, indeed, Jesus says to his manager, you can no longer be in this particular service. Now, before he is put out of this particular position, the man of which the parable speaks and which Jesus here mentions is in the midst of the despair and has a sudden insight. Well, I can no longer do this job. I will be asked to give an account and I probably will come up short. So, let me prepare for the future. And this is where Jesus says, learn from this dishonest steward. Not his dishonesty, not his false dealings, but rather that he is prudent enough to know that there will be a future and that in many ways, you are the ones that decide what this future will look like. That's what we call by the old English word prudence. And so what does he do? He says, I will decide what to do. That when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. My friends, there you have it. He knows that something is coming, it might not be too good. His situation seems to be desperate, but he says, let me think of what is possible for the future and how to prepare for that kind of fu uh, future. And he does what commends him to his own people, that he calls them together, and what does he do? He cuts their debt. He reduces what they owe. And remember, I said earlier that the manager's decision, as long as he is still manager, is acting with the full legal authority of his own master. He does what he can so that his future may be assured. So I'm going to ask myself and each of us who are listening today, when we deal with the things of this world, are we using them in such a way that we can 
assure our own heavenly future. I don't mean just success in the coming days or years or uh, achieve certain goals and fulfill the plans that we have made for ourselves. Because at the end of our parable that Jesus himself tells us, he makes it very clear all the things that are given to us in this world during our lifetime, they will end. There will be a time when they are no longer with us and for us. What if? What if God would ask you today, how are you dealing with the blessings of life that I have showered upon you? How are you taking care of all the things that I have entrusted to you? What if God at this moment asks you, you can no longer be in the management that I, of the things that I have entrusted to you. Well, this is part of the story, part of the parable that Jesus our Savior himself tells us. That he says, learn from this dishonest manager what? How clever, determined, yes, even recklessly, but above all, how prudently he acts with the things that were given to him in relationship to other people. And why does he act that way? We read, so that people may receive me into their houses. That is truly foresight that gets him to the place where he thinks he will spend eternity. Are you aware of that? That you know how you will spend eternity? Well, he did it first of all by cutting debt, reducing what people owe. And by the way, that's the only way that we're going to survive into eternity. What the unjust steward does for the debtors, God in Christ does for you and me. We read in St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, God forgives us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us. Remember, we're being asked, how much do you owe my master? And if you're halfway as honest as we should try at least to be, then we will have to confess that we are sinners and do not measure up to the high standard that God's holy law sets of us and demands of us. And therefore, particularly it is important for us that we think of the future that we think of debt reduction, that we know what, for instance, holy absolution is all about when the pastor pronounces, not because he learned it or studied theology and has a right to say it, but because Christ commanded him to say it, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God asks you, how do you deal with the things I entrust to you? Well, is it fortunate that that day has not yet arrived in the sense that the final account must now be given? That's not the day today, apparently. But today is the day of salvation. Not yet the final account. The day of salvation where God calls us, when we are told again by the Apostle Paul, behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Whenever the word of God hits you, when he confronts us with what he did for us and to you in the name of, our, uh, of his love for us in Jesus Christ, his Son, that's when salvation comes into your life, when the Holy Spirit wants to move you to accept 
accept this salvation to open your heart to the call of Jesus. It's important that we read in our parable that this dishonest manager says, I have decided what to do. Do you know what to do? Do you know that the Holy Spirit is calling you to faith? That he is telling you of the love of God in Christ Jesus, not because you're so good, not because you were the perfect manager of all the things that he entrusted to your care, but because of, of his unfathomable love that he showed in the death and resurrection of his own son. The final account, that's God's decision whenever that may happen in your life. But today, this is the day of salvation. It's the call of Jesus to you. Amen. In the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for mercy, that in turn we would be quick to show mercy to others, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the whole church, that through the Holy Spirit's work we may be faithful stewards of God's gracious gifts, especially in proclaiming the salvation he provides for all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the homes in which we live, that God would soften obdurate hearts, turn parents and children toward each other in love and patience, and that he would banish the spirit of impudence, stubbornness, and rebellion from us all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For everyone in our nation and for those who govern this land, that we would be a humble people, enlightened in faith, and move to do every good deed by the lamp of God's true word. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are suffering any temptation and affliction, that our Lord, who is faithful, would make clear to them the way of escape from their difficulties and enable them to stand firm through faith in Christ Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those grieving and sorrowful, that they might have patience in tribulation and be led back to the joy of God's salvation. Especially show you a helpful presence to the people of the Ukraine and bring the war to an end. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For true fear of the Lord in all of us, that we would not abandon his truth and remain faithful in our Christian calling. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a fervent love of the Lord, that we would willingly show mercy to others and thereby cover a multitude of sins. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For constant trust in the Lord, that in repentance we would return to our baptism daily. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have blessed us bountifully and given us daily bread. We implore you, preserve us from all covetousness, and enliven our hearts to share your gifts willingly with all who are in need, that we may be found to be faithful stewards of your gifts and abide in your grace when we are removed from life's stewardship and stand before your judgment seat. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I invite you to join in the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.